Bar graph view meters can be easily made with a simple integrated circuit. There are several of them with different characteristics, but they all present the same basic functionality. One or more LEDs in a row are used to visualize more or less precisely the voltage amplitude presented to the input. That voltage can be either a direct current or an alternate current, and in particular it could be the output of an audio amplifier. But what is inside these integrated circuits? How do they make possible this kind of behavior? To answer these questions, I decided to design and build a simple gadget that shows how a bar graph view meter works. I did this with discrete components, so you can see the principle used by the integrated circuits I just mentioned. Let's get into the details. Hi there! I am Carlo Carrano, and this is Electronics Engineering Made Easy! At the first glance, we would be tempted to say that this is a complicated circuit, with so many components. However, looking more deeply into it, you can soon realize that there is a lot of repetition. In fact, you can see that the basic element of the circuit is the one made with the components Q1, R1, R10, D1, and D10. This block of component then replicates several times to increase the number of LEDs used in the bar graph. In this particular case, the same circuit is replicated 8 more times for a total of 9 LEDs in the bar graph. You can also see that each block, or stage, receives as the input the signal coming from the output of the previous stage. Diodes from D10 to D17 are used to provide a different threshold to each stage. In fact, let's say that the first stage is triggered when the voltage on the anode of D10 reaches about 3 volts. In order to trigger the second stage, we will need 3 volts on this point. But that means that the voltage of the first stage has to go up to 3 plus 0 0.6 volt or 3.6 volts. The extra 0 0.6 volt is the forward voltage of diode D10. Similarly, to reach each further stage, we will need an input voltage 0 point volt higher for each stage we want to light up. In the end, to light up the last stage, we will need an input voltage of at least 3 volts plus 8 times 0 0.6, or 7.8 volts. Once the threshold is reached in a stage, the corresponding transistor switches on and starts conducting a current on the collector that is only limited by the LED and the resistor in series to it, which in this case is 330 ohm. With the values in the circuit, the LED current will be about 20 mA. So, when we apply a voltage to the input terminals, depending on how high the voltage is, we will see a number of consecutive LEDs lighting up, while the remaining will stay off because their respective stages have not been triggered yet, or in other words, the voltage at those stages hasn't yet reached the threshold imposed by the diodes. Not also that resistors R10 through R18 are not all of the same value. You can see 47K, 39, 33, 10K, 4.7K. This is because by the time the voltage reaches the threshold in this last stage with transistor Q9, so we have here 3 volts, the voltage on the previous transistors is higher and higher while we move to the left of the circuit, up to 7.8 when, when we are here. Therefore, to avoid damage to the transistor down the left side of the circuit, we need to increase the base resistor when moving from the right to the left of the circuit. Another thing to notice is the trim pot located at the connectors for the input signal. The circuit as it is is capable of handling signals up to the value of the power supply, which is 9 volts. However, 
we can adjust the trim pot to handle higher signals just by moving the trim pot cursor toward the end that is connected to ground in order to get only a fraction of the actual input signal. Conversely, if you had a very small input signal that could not even trigger the first stage of this circuit, you could still add a very simple amplifier between the source of the signal and the input of this circuit. That amplifier would help increase the level of the signal to the required value to light up all the LEDs. Finally, you see that the bar graph meter is powered with a 9 volts power supply. I use a, such a value so you can use a 9 volt battery if you like to try the circuit. However, if you wanted to use this circuit as a part of a more complex system having a higher value of the power supply, you could just modify resistors R1 through R9 and use the power supply of that system. For example, if you planned to use a 12 volt instead of 9, you would use a resistor of 470 ohms rather than 330, and everything would work fine, you would still have 20 milliamps for each LEDs. Remember, however, that the 9 volt here is the minimum voltage you can use to correctly power the bar graph circuit. You can only increase this value of power supply to a higher value and, of course, increase correspondingly all the resistors from R1 to R9. That is because we need a power supply that exceeds the voltage at the base of the leftmost transistor Q1, which can be as high as 7.8 volts, as we said before. And now, let's see the assembled version of this circuit on a breadboard. To save some time, I preassembled the circuit, but you can definitely see how the assembly reflects the schematic. Here is the row of transistors, Q1, Q2, Q3, and so forth, up to Q9, um, with the corresponding resistors R1 to R9, over here, and the LEDs over here. Diodes from D10 to D17 are here on the bottom side, and you can see how each diode is connected to the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. And at each diode there is another resistor attached to it, which connects the anode of the diode, in this case, with the base of the transistor, and then the next one with the base of the other transistor, and so forth and so forth, until the end. You can also see that all the emitters of the transistor are connected to the negative rail, the ground, basically, and all the LED anodes are connected to the positive rail over here. Finally, at the input of the circuit, you can see the train pot that is used to reduce the input voltage and adapt it to the need of the VU meter. Let's now connect the circuit to a 9 volt power supply and let's connect the input to an audio source. For simplicity, I put these pins over here to easily connect the input. In this case, I will use my function generator attached right here and here to input the necessary voltage to the circuit and have the LEDs lighting up. Before connecting the function generator, I will set the trim pot so that it will allow only a small percentage of the input voltage to reach the first stage of the bar graph. Once I connect the function generator, I will adjust the trim pot so that when the generator is providing the max voltage, the green LED is just lighting up. So let's connect the function generator, which is right here. I will set the voltage to the minimum right now. And it is going to connect here and here. And then the power supply, 9 volt right now, with this cable, which I will connect over here. So now I am going to increase the function generator to the max value. And you can see that some of the LEDs are already lighting up. So I now will adjust the potentiometer so that the green LED is also on. There it is. So now, if I change 
the output of the function generator increasing and decreasing the, the voltage, the bar graph should follow suit. Let's see if that is true. So let's put it about half the way, right here, and you can see that the bar graph is doing exactly the same thing. Let me actually do this so we can see better what's going on. I don't know if you can see the LEDs up, but if I change here, you can see the LED changing too. Until they are all out in this direction, and they are all up in this other direction. I can also adjust the function generator to automatically increase and decrease the input voltage so that the bar graph will go up and down automatically following the signal amplitude. Let's do that. So you can see how now the bar graph is going up and down automatically following the signal coming from the function generator. So now that we have tested the circuit and know that it works, we can build a more stable version of it on a perf board. So let's do that right now. So, now that we have the circuit assembled on a perf board, let's connect it again to the power supply and to the function generator and see if it still works as expected. So, these are the cables that come from the power supply, which is there, set to 9.1 volts. Let's connect this over here. This is the negative and this is the positive of the power supply. This one instead is the input of the device which we will connect to the function generator which is right here and right now it's 
and let it run at about 900 hertz 800 so negative goes same place here and the input goes here so now we will have to adjust the potentiometer of course and let me put it to the minimum now let me increase the output of the function generator to the maximum and now let's set up the trimmer like we did before to a value such that all the LEDs turn on there we go and here I'm stopping so now we should see that changing the amplitude of the signal from here I should be able to change the number of LEDs that light up and there we go so the other thing like we did with the breadboard I'm gonna set this such a way we use a variable signal and look it works exactly as expected as you have seen a bar graph VU meter is really something simple to design and to build the commercial integrated circuits that provide this functionality have inside a circuit that more or less reflects what we have done here or sometimes they use a more complicated way to trigger the various LED stages by using voltage comparators rather than simple diodes. However, the principle remains the same, and if you build the circuit I presented, you can show off your newly acquired knowledge with your friends and family. See you next time, and as usual, happy experiments!